Paul, we'd like to first of all welcome everyone who's attending this very important and timely panel discussion, which is focused primarily on sustainable investing and ESG investing in India. And we've uh, pulled together a very distinguished panel of uh, participants. And in fact, indeed, we will we will have uh, not formal presentations, but a, a very informed conversation with questions and answers and clarifications. So let me give brief introductions to all of our panelists. Uh, we have Shirak Mehta, who is the Senior Fund Manager for Alternative Investments at Quantum AMC. Uh, in 2017, he was ranked as the fourth best fund manager in the world under the age of 40. Shirak has more than 18 years of experience in managing commodities. He also specializes in the field of alternative investment strategies and runs at least five funds for quantum. He's based in Mumbai. Um, we have uh, Amit Bhatia, who is an award-winning social entrepreneur and the founder of Aspire Impact. Uh, he founded Aspire in 2007 as a social entrepreneur, uh, social enterprise in impact leadership and ecosystem development. In 2013, he also founded Aspire Circle, which is India's preeminent fellowship for social leadership. Previously, Amit was the inaugural CEO of the Global Steering Group of Impact Investment, a 32-country network and he is based in Uganda, um, India. Uh, we have Ravi Chidaram, who is the co-founder of TC Capital, a pan-Asian investment bank that adapts the best practices from the world's leading investment banking institutions and management consultants to create customized solutions and first-class execution for its clients. TC Capital has also developed its own in-house venture capital division focusing on tech companies, and the lobby is located in Singapore. And last, we have David Goldsmith, who has been an eternal serial entrepreneur, global and domestic, and one of the most uh, exciting developments is he's the founder of Project Moon Hut, which is an ongoing process or dynamic of using innovations from the moon to then bring those new innovations and paradigm shifts back to Earth in order to make Earth a sustainable community for all of the species. He and his team are designing plans to make Earth a sustainable community for all inhabitants. David is also the author of the best-selling book, Paid to Think, a leader's toolkit for redefining your future. Uh, he's in New York. So welcome to all our distinguished panelists. And so why don't we move straight ahead? And I wanted to begin with Shirak, uh, just a broad question and how you are understanding uh, sustainable investment or ESG investments in India, and how does how do you see that as your manager of quantum fund? Sure, thank you, Dwight. Uh, if you look at the sustainable investing landscape in India, it's still at a very nascent stage. Uh, we have just begun, uh, but I think we will have to move a lot more rapidly. Our foray into uh, ESG investing uh, started from 2014 really when we started looking at the ESG space. Uh, uh, but our history goes back since 1996, where we had something called this integrity screen into our investing practices, uh, which kind of looks at the governance of companies and uh, managements or uh, companies where we don't like the governance, uh, we do not invest in those companies. So we already had that background with us. And uh, we also looked at some environmental and social software aspects into our investing. Uh, but in 2014, when we talked to our clients, be it, in, be it pension funds or sovereign funds, uh, they kind of were looking at ESG incrementally and were looking to move into that space. And we also kind of uh, reconciled with the risk and opportunities lying with sustainable investing. So we kind of made a foray into uh, looking at uh, ESG and uh, we kind of evolved our own proprietary uh, ESG methodology to look at companies. Uh, the challenges that we face when it comes to investing is largely uh, uh, data availability. There are not much disclosures in India. Uh, so over a period of time, we went through a loan curve, covered a lot of companies and started investing uh, in our fund, which we launched in July 2019. So overall, uh, ESG investing will gain a lot of prominence. There is no two way about it. It will become mainstream going forward. 
regulators are emphasizing a lot of disclosures from companies uh, so that will uh, that will become a significant uh, leap step forward uh, as companies uh, top 1000 companies are mandated to disclose uh, make significant disclosures on sustainability from next year onwards this year it's going to be voluntary they have given that leeway to companies but from next year top 1000 companies will have to get that data out so that will help us a lot in terms of expanding our universe uh, since 5 years we have begun because of data disclosures we have barely covered about 160 companies in india uh, but that is rapidly expanding as companies are kind of getting sensitized to the importance and the investor thrust and the regulatory thrust towards uh, sustainable data disclosures and therefore we are seeing uh, many many companies uh, not only getting better on disclosures but also seeing where they lack uh, and improving the practices as well so i think uh, over next few years it will become a mainstream investment uh, and most of the investment strategies will imbibe uh, es your sustainability in some form or the other mm. so it's, it's so in india the, the sort of the, the the layout in india now in the space is uh, expanding you see it rapidly picking up in the next couple of years regulatory agencies are kicking in uh, more and more data is being disclosed um So I meant given this uh this type of uh, layout this rock just painted for us. How do you see corporations competing this era of impact capitalism if we can use that? For us? So do I uh, I you know Harvard Business School recently published a data including a fair amount of Indian companies showing out of 1800 companies one third of them have their full profits wiped out just if we were to account for the environment cost. So think of reliance industries in India. Four and a half billion in net profit, seven and a half billion in just environment cost. So our largest corporation in India stands to lose in the era of impact capitalism, and they have no choice. But so the best risk strategy, you know, at this point in time, is not just adoption of ESG or sustainable, but full adoption of impact, which is kind of the third and the final step in this journey of impact continuum. so i am expecting corp means corporate we do impact assessments companies in india like ini farm aether energy nsd have all started carrying our impact ratings and i think the era of impact transparency is here now as you know chirag mentioned you know we are at the same time trying to go to three different steps companies are still adopting esg you know and that is literally and you know he's right 500 companies have been mandated so far another 500 come online with bisr reporting but at the same time indian companies have an opportunity to leapfrog an era of esg and sustainability to straight away go into impact and the reason this is going to happen and happen very quickly in this decade is the world is moving very fast and as we discussed to an era of impact accounting as we speak sustainability accounting standards board is rewriting gap to account for, to make sure corporates can report on impact and an era where we move from just a financial eps to an impact weighted eps is upon us so imagine would the markets not start you know valuing a company's long term prospect using its impact weighted eps which may be higher or lower than financial eps based on social and environmental impact so because gap is getting rewritten and many of our companies have different instruments you know listed on international stock exchanges this is a foregone conclusion you know and so there is a rush to move to to com- to be ready to compete in a era of impact capitalism the question is how much will happen voluntarily how much will happen by legislative mandates of government coming in saying do it now do it uh, i think the you know the most progressive companies will start adopting this very very quickly because that's the only way they can you know guarantee long term security to their shareholders and those who are going to you know be you know dragging their feet are going to get fallen behind so this is a revolution of sorts it's a you know think of it this way if in 19th century was all about return and 20th century was risk and return 21st century is risk return and impact and just mm-hmm. like we learned how to measure risk in the middle of last century we are learning how to measure impact in this century there's a nobel prize out there someone who standardizes it and that will happen very quickly but this the fact that this is going to happen is a foregone conclusion and i think because we are in the middle of this revolution and it's a 
it's a slow seismic civilizational change once in 250 years. And I'd just end with, think of it this way, Dwight. We are finally giving the invisible hand of the markets, an invisible heart, you know, with the idea of impact. And mm -hmm. I think this is what this world was missing. So I think the fact that corporations will have to adopt this is a foregone conclusion. Now it's going to be just a race to the finish line. And uh, I think uh, impact assessments, ESG ratings, sustainability ratings, you know, bonds are already getting rated. You know, all of that is going to happen. You know, so there's going to be a little bit of a rush out there for all large corporations to figure out and, you know, what is the right way to go because there is no one standardized rating. But I think the day the standardized rating comes, these the global markets are going to be reset. Mm. No, it's very helpful. Uh, risk, return, and impact. Uh, and Amit, he's, he's maybe one of the people here on these squares will be getting that Nobel Prize for, uh, for measurement. But as far as uh, measuring long-term sustainability, uh, definitely, Ravi, I know you have developed with your one of your v very prominent VC in-house companies, RIM. Could you talk a little bit about that? What is RIM and, in fact, how it does relate to impact assessment? Yeah, no, first of all, I agree completely with Amit and Chirag that, yeah, um, to have genuine, authentic ESG investing, um, you need to first have good data on the companies you're evaluating, and you need to have integrated financial and impact accounting. I agree completely that one has to judge a company by adjusted profits, what inputs are going in to create what profits. They could be positive and negative impacts, by the way, but uh, I agree completely with the thinking. What we try to do at RIM is to enable that process. Our view is that the biggest obstacle, uh, both to companies and investors, to really, really uh, understand sustainability performance is to build uh, education into the process to educate people on global standards, on materiality, so that the right KPIs, first of all, are tracked to help companies measure those uh, KPIs uh, and report the right data, and then actually look at their performance. And in particular, you know, to Amit's point, impact. We have tried to integrate some impact frameworks into uh, our analytics, including the value-based alliance framework, which is actually um, uh, an NGO that is doing some very interesting things in evaluating impacts and integrating them into financial accounts. And also Harvard Business School, uh, their impact weight, weight uh, uh, scheme is, is an interesting one to look at product impacts, human capital impacts, and so on. So uh, I agree with David, who said in the introduction that SDGs are too cosmetic, too broad. You know, one needs to get granular. Uh, so it's really, Rim, what we try to do is try to take it step by step. Education, measurement, uh, and analytics, and with a big focus on impact. This is the only way to give insights to companies and to investors on how they're really performing. Thank you. Very helpful. Um, David, your name was, was raised, lifted up, so we definitely want to turn to you. And so uh, just also the broad question is similar. How do you see uh, the environment in India being conducive to impact investing? I, I think the, the first challenge, the first question we have to ask ourselves and ask everybody is what – We've defined sustainability, we've defined impact, but have we truly defined if we follow these principles, will we get to the end game we're looking for? So what I've heard and what I hear is that we're doing, we're really moving very much towards solving these challenges. And yet, uh, having lived in Hong Kong for 10 years, I've worked throughout the region, I don't actually see it happening. Korea made a, a massive change within 20 to 25 years. And we're talking about India becoming a $10 trillion economy. But what does a $10 trillion economy mean? It means similar to China. They built a 50-year dump and they filled the 50-year dump in 25 years. So a GDP rise and a higher standard of living 
means that we have Bitcoin using 7% of the energy that's being used. And the person who invented Siri did some analytics on your mobile phone. Every post you put on Instagram, Facebook, or any content place, uh, provider, it takes about 320 watt. You could run enough, you have enough electricity to run three 20 watt light bulbs for an hour for every single post. Hmm. So when we talk about this term, uh, I've heard through the programs, uh, there's a lot of optimism and I love we're being recorded. Optimism is great, but I'm a little bit of a pessimist too. A 15 CM rise, 15 CM would devastate Bangladesh. 159 million people, they're already every year impacted by sea level water rise. That impacts displacement, which puts pressure on India. When we look at India as a whole, uh, I've worked in different parts of India, and I think the challenges are far worse to to change an entire society of over a billion people to be able to fulfill the sustainability, whatever that means, target. Because as we do one thing, what we're doing is damaging another. And there's a, I can't remember the guy's last name, Daniel. There was a report just put out recently. One individual took a hundred, a group of individuals took 150 reports of what's happening in the world and combined them instead of separately. And the report came back, it's far worse than anybody thinks. So the definition, my biggest challenge with accelerating India's transition towards sustainability and impact investing is, is the work that's being done actually going to turn into sustainability or uh, an, an added number to a certain group of people who have more income than the average individual? So I'm not sure. And the, the, even the, the program itself doesn't define what does sustainability mean? And I, I don't think we have great answers for that. Indeed, indeed. That's a very important question um, <clears throat> because sustainability, I mean, we hear lots of terms. Uh, we've heard impact investing. We've heard ESG. We've heard uh, philanthropy as a form of impact. We've heard charity. So there's a whole uh, just conversation on exactly what it is. But one related question to that, what it is, and this is for Chirac again, um, do you see ESG performing in the real world? We have discussions about the, the terms. People are rushing to all kinds of international standards. There's greenwashing. There's not greenwashing. But on the ground, does, do you see ESG perform, really performing in the real world? Yeah, I think uh, there is a lot of evidence out there which says that, you know, sustainability performs. And I think uh, I'll counter David with saying that there are companies in India who are better than their counterparts, even in Europe or U.S. Uh, for example, look at cement companies in India. Cement companies in India are doing much more or are much better in terms of the environmental footprint, in terms of their disclosures, in terms of their practices, even compared to the European giants like Holcim or Lafarge. So uh, you do have, even by EU taxonomy norms, they are classified as sustainable companies. So you do why? have good companies. Why? I'm jumping in. Why? We're using cement. We're using cement. So the, fact that you're using, cement. The, exa- the example you're using is cement and reporting, not the fact that we've eliminated cement, which is one of the biggest ex- exclu- ex- excluders of CO2 in the world in an economy that wants to grow. Yeah, I, I don't, that, 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 does that make sense that you just use a comparison to something that's detrimental to the planet? No, I mean, what's an alternative? India needs infrastructure. India needs roads. India needs ports. India needs so uh, so. There will be cement use, but has have the companies gone beyond their traditional remit or not? They have. They are doing their bit in terms of making themselves far better than even the large companies globally. So they are seeing that how can they reduce the impact while uh, doing what is necessary for India. So they are kind of uh, you know. Uh, going beyond. And I think that is what is required by Indian companies so that they kind of move ahead and try to reduce their footprints overall, be it societal, be it environmental, and try to move in the right direction. So we are seeing that move. We are seeing Indian companies going there. Uh, and, and there is a plethora of evidence that says that coming uh, right to your question, 
that sustainable companies, when you look at their track record, they have done far better than companies that are not doing much or not going beyond their traditional remit. So that's an evidence. And that is why I think a lot of investments are moving into ESG because there is evidence of ESG companies doing well. There is evidence of ESG indices doing well. And when you come to the active management, you have seen ESG funds doing well. And I think when this kind of evidence gathers or piles up, uh, there is a move uh, that convincing people that we need to move towards sustainable investing. So uh, in our experience, uh, the fund has a short track record of two years, uh, but it has gone through a market cycle of its own. You had seen markets fall because of COVID and then rebound much more aggressively. In both the phases of the market, the fund has done better than the traditional market cap weighted indices, than most of the funds also uh, which are actively managed using various different strategies. So that gives us that encouragement that, you know, uh, ESG or the process that we have towards looking at uh, companies on a sustainable basis uh, is working well for us. So overall, I think there is evidence, there is evidence piling up, and I think uh, it is becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy out there and which will drive investments in a bigger way towards sustainable investing. I can't hear you. We can't hear you. Uh, Dwight, you're on mute. Yeah, you shouldn't, you don't, you don't need to let mute unless you've got sound behind you. Right. I have an airplane overflowing my house, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so that's uh, very helpful, uh, Sharak, on that concrete example of the fun and what's happening. And it raises to me the question about how do, how do investors see it? And earlier, I mean, you talked about the corporation side, right? How do corporations compete in the era of impact capitalism? So can you take the perspective of the investors, say for the, in the next decade or so, do you, uh, do you think impact investing will overcome uh, people accumulating capitalism in and of itself? Or so the, is the morality, how, do, how will we stand? Where will ESG impact investing be for investors in 10 years? So do I think of a look at the data and I'll just give some numbers. Out of the 100 trillion plus global assets under management, 40 trillion has already moved to the impact continuum, out of which little less than 35 trillion is what's called responsible investing, funds putting money in ESG compliant companies. Another five, six or trillion plus is sustainability investing, which is everything going into companies, whether they are doing sustainable agriculture, sustainable fisheries, you know, renewable energy, et cetera, and about a trillion in impact enterprises, which is affordable education, affordable health, you know, uh, agriculture. So 40 trillion of 100 plus trillion, depending whether you read PwC report on global AUM or KPMG, has already moved. The reason these real dollars have moved from pure wealth maximization strategies to responsible, sustainable, or impact investment strategies is results. They did not get morality overnight or over the last 10 decades. The investors did not develop a consci conscience. What's happened is it's surely money following returns. And let me give you therefore the returns data. You're in Chicago and Morningstar is your neighbor. Morningstar data for 2019 all sustainable funds, one third of them were in the top quartile and almost three, two thirds of them were in the top two quartiles globally. You know, you look at in India, SBI mutual fund did a study and ESG funds during this COVID year 2020 fell 13% less than non-ESG funds. When I was the CEO of India's Impact Investors Council, I got McKinsey to do a study to benchmark you know, impact investment returns vis-a-vis -vis pure private equity venture capital. We looked at the period 2010 to 2016. Impact investment delivered 11% dollar denominated IRR, 11% the same as pure private equity venture capital during the same period. And, you know, we looked at uh, exit data of 60 plus companies. So the fact that you can be, you know, at the least responsible or better still sustainable or, you know, for, for the good of the universe, impact oriented and get the same returns. Why would anyone want to invest in pure wealth maximization strategies in oil, shell, extractive companies? And David is right. You know, I mean, you know th those companies are, you know, are, are losing favor with the large investors. Now, let me talk about what's happening in big, you know, pension funds, PGGM, you know, the Dutch fund. 
they've all come out, the chairs of all the large, you know, pensions insurers saying they are going to take out from their portfolios. And these are 250 billion euros and more. You know, we're talking about very large and we'll talk about BlackRock later, 7 trillion. But the very largest, you know, insurance pensions have said they are not going to invest in fossil fuels. They are not going to be an extractive industry. Those stocks are going to get dumped. PGGM alone has 11% stocks, which they could not map. 11% of their 250 billion euros on the impact continue. They are going to liquidate it. It's a public promise, you know, to the Dutch public and to the Dutch government. Now the question is timing. They are quiet on timing, but it's a matter of time. So I think, you know, from an investor standpoint, you know, it is but natural that the stars are aligning, returns are aligning with values, and therefore, I think it is but natural to your opening question that by the end of this decade, you know, it may not be illegal, but it will be immoral to make money for its own sake. If anyone is out there in the party talking about his returns, you know, for its own wealth, it is going you know, the person is not going to get many years. You will have to say, I made so much money. I made returns while putting so many girls through school or so many farmer loans in Kenya or so many. I improved textile factories in Bangladesh today, which example, et cetera, et cetera. And you can do all of that. The last thing I'll say on this investors is now there's public pressure. People, ordinary people did not know what happens to their pension money. So Richard Curtis in Great Britain, for example, the famous movie director who made four weddings and a funeral, Bridget's Diary, Mr. Bean, et cetera. You know, the guy, you know, comic, he's launched a campaign called Make My Money Matter, where he's getting average citizens in UK to write to the chief investment officer of their pension saying, tell us, what are you doing with our money? Are you investing it in fossil fuels or extractive industries or harmful industries? Or are you creating some sustainability? Now, imagine CIOs are getting millions of letters and emails from average citizens putting pressure finally on pensions and insurances, etc., to say, they will have to report, you know, how their money matters. And I'll end on this note. There is a small billion dollar pension fund out of Australia called Christian Super, which exactly does this. Their annual return statement to every pension holder says your money made earn 7 percent return this year while putting so many, you know, you know, hectares of, you know, land in Kenya through sustainable farming, but giving so many fishermen in Philippines, these their earnings went up so much by putting so many girls through school, you know, while putting, you know. So imagine if your pension money. If you are making the same return, but annually you get that feel good that your money did well for the that is the future of investing. That is where we are headed. And, you know, it is going to be, you know, immoral by the end of this decade. So if, if investors don't change, they are going to be forced by governments and, you know, obviously, you know, retail you know, investors whose money it is these people are managing to change. And I think if one felt, you know, skeptical look at the data on ethical consumption and sustainable consumption look pick any survey ac nielsen or other young people especially millennials are paying more for sustainable products ethical products when they buy organic food when they buy a body shop product when they buy you know in india fabs india shirt or kurta so people are getting you know educated that yes you know, it might cost me a little bit more, but I will do that. Therefore, companies are able to turn around and therefore we are getting the ecosystem, you know, to change. So I think investors are changing and it's because all stars are finally aligned, you know, to make this, you know, impact economy a reality. Mm. No, thank you. Very helpful. Very helpful. I mean, you suggest to me uh, the importance of education, right? Yeah, that the director in England, the UK, he's educating the public. Uh, millennials are being more educated. And I know education is so important uh, that, uh, Ravi, I want to raise the question to you. I know you have an education class on ESG or sustainable investment that you've developed. And maybe you could share some insight on that as a, as a model for how to continue to educate both students and the broader public. Yeah, I teach a class at uh, Yale and US here in Singapore uh, called The Good Company. Uh, we touch on many of the topics, uh, you know, that the panel has been talking about today. It's a group of undergraduates. And, um, you know, there's a lot of interest, uh, as uh, Amit pointed out, especially uh, amongst the younger generations in this topic. So it's a bit of a, an overall discussion on the evolution of capitalism, 
and uh, the role companies play, good and bad. I think, you know, we try to keep it. I, mean, I think, you know, everyone has made some very good points. It's a, sustainability is a very ambiguous issue, and there's a lot of complexity and subtlety to it. Uh, nothing is unambiguously good or bad. You know, what is called the green sector is rarely so. And, you know, sure, no one should be funding fossil fuels, but the reality is hedge funds make outsized return funding fossil fuels, which is why they get funded. So, you know, look, there are no simple solutions. No one has all the answers. My class simply tries to provide a framework, uh, you know, for analyzing a lot of these weighty topics, you know. Um, nor do I believe investment alone or investors are the most important stakeholder, you know, for a company, you know. So, you know, we, we, we try to touch on, on many of these kinds of topics, yeah. But um, very much along the lines of, of this panel discussion and many of the things touched on are what I try to introduce my young students to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Again, we keep coming back to this question of what is sustainability and what is ESG and all of those things. Um, well, to me, one of the most revolutionary projects in sustainability is uh, David's project Moon Hut, which frames not only the conversation, but it frames the cosmos. And David, I was hoping that you could expound on that. We had a great conversation last week, and it was just mind blowing uh, what they've been doing and what they plan to do in this area of how they understand sustainability. Can you, can you like enlighten us about your project? I'll try to do it as quickly as I can. And I will frame it with two points. The first one is I'm not a space person. I don't wake up and look at the stars and dream and plan. I've grown up. Everybody's talked about being on the moon and 50,000 50, people flying in and at what's called an O'Neill station in space. Uh, we've heard about a million people in Mars in the, by, the tw by 2050. Mathematically, it doesn't work. And the second is that from my research on sustainability, I don't see any of it working. So I, I would argue that anybody listening, video or, or now, if, would you bet your life, your entire savings, your family's life in the next 30 years, we will have solved this fast enough to address the climate change challenges which will force people from their homes, which will address the fact that 500 uh, animals in Australia were just put on the endangered species list. Would you be willing to say that just America alone dumps 12 billion gallons of municipal waste into the oceans every day? That's not radioactive waste. That is not uh, agricultural waste, industrial waste. Europe is larger. China and India are far larger. So that's over 50 billion gallons destroying the oceans every day. So with that said, another solution. We are, our intention is to do something that's very different, is to say, some of the, we can't live a day on earth in a tier one, two, a tier four, three, or two society without space. We don't think about it that way. Now, our, our phone call here, this is space. The, the mouse that we use is space. Glasses, scratch resistant, resistant lenses are space. The outfit a firefighter puts on is space tech. The tank on the back is space. Freeze dried food is space. You can't get a package delivered to your home today that doesn't have some form of space. You look to see what the weather is every single day. You don't think of it as space, you think of it as weather. So when, when you get a package, the agricultural person had used weather mapping. The GPS got the Maersk ship to sail the oceans. All of this is space. So what if, what if the answer for solving for Earth, the 10 billion people, a million people in space does not excite me, but what if the 10 billion people and the 50 million species on Earth actually need space to impact Earth? So we've designed plans for man to live sustainably on the moon, not self-sustaining. There's no society on this planet uh, besides the really aborigines. There's none that solely prov provides for itself, whether it be spices from India or tents from Bangladesh or some type of soap that came out of Indonesia or wherever you go around the world, there's something from someplace. So we've designed four phases of development of the moon. And in that, those innovations to get there actually transform our thinking. You cannot live on the moon unless you're sustainable, meaning you, you don't have extra water. So you can't take a shower like my friend in Chalmen. She takes a 20 to 50 minute shower every single day. 
It's, mm-hmm. it's the Western world's fault. It's because Hollywood promotes and the lifestyle is the rich and famous, the so 2,800 uh, 2850 billionaires in the world. Those are promoting a lifestyle that's unsustainable. The challenge is we've got this thing, we get this on the moon, it will change our thinking about what does that mean. A bigger real estate space to me is just geography. It's not an industry. It's just a geography. That's it. Because you'll be an accountant on the moon. You're still an accountant on the moon. If you're accountant in space, you're accountant in space. You're not an astronaut accountant. And you're not an astra, a, a moon accountant. You're an accountant. So then what we've got is we are designing a platform that will accelerate a combination of alliances, community engagement, and governance models to look at how we actually live, work, and play throughout the world and use those endeavors, turning them back to, uh, to modify how we live on this earth. So those innovations will then flip back and they will solve our biggest challenges. For example, the use of concrete can't do that in space the same way or the use of uh, uh, fossil fuels. And it's pragmatic. We'll have 1,644 people in space uh, living on the moon in approximately 20 years. That's the number we've come up with. That's a reasonable number. So it's not about space. It's that space transforms our thinking. When you think about solving for space, you don't have answers. But when you solve for space, and meet you're unbelievably full of un- numbers that are incredible. The challenge is if I asked you 10 things about space, you probably couldn't answer them. And you'd have to say, how would I do that in space? How would I take a shower in space? How would I go to the toilet in space? How would I, how would I, would I throw my shirt out when I'm done into the dump? Probably not. I'd reuse it. But what if I could 3D print and take the materials, break them down and 3D print? That would be amazing. Because if every home on earth had a 3D printer that took the resources that we have, food or otherwise, and we could 3D print product, we'd, we wouldn't have plastic in the oceans. So what we're doing is accelerating the earth and space-based ecosystem to change earth. And it's just a paradigm shifting way of thinking. And actually in India, there's a guy by the name of Gadahar Reddy. He owns a company called Nopo. If you want to invest in his company, he solved for space. He solved for drinking fresh water on, the, on Mars. But we have his one major challenge. We're not on Mars. So he's using it for clean water on Earth. He's using it for super black coatings. He's using it for super strength enhancements. It's using for medical devices in bodies for uh, biomarkers. So someone who solved for space without ever making it to space is solving for Earth. And I think because I can't see anything on a global scale, 7.5 billion people, 50 million species. I don't see one thing that's working where someone would bet their life today that it will be solved in 10 years. Not one. David, that's a very uh, provocative and uh, pioneering view of sustainability. And when I've always, I spoke with you earlier, but one of the things that impressed me was that it's a total integration. It's not just uh, aspect by aspect and it's literally a cosmic integration uh which also reminds me about uh some of the uh, esg assessments that i know that Chirac have been doing with quantum funds there i know you had mentioned about doing external uh, experts but you decided to develop your own internal assessment so is your assessment integrated as david suggests or is it more piece by piece how do you uh how do you do esg assessment in your companies <coughs> Yeah. So, uh, Dwight, we kind of concur with the fact that, you know, uh, like beauty and value, ESG lies in the eye of the beholder. Currently, the data sets that we get are so fragmented. Therefore, analysis of that data sets is very, very different across. And that is why if you look at rating agencies on ESG, the correlation for a company's ratings is around 0.4. Whereas for a credit rating agencies, which, of course, they have been behind the curve the time, but still it's as high as 0.9. So that really tells you that, you know, it is very, very different and you have to look at from your lens and how you subjectively assess the data that is out there today. Uh, So we kind of when we started in 2014 looking at the ESG space, we went to different external service providers to ask uh, uh, some sample reports in terms of how they would rate companies and what their ratings are. Uh, We gave them certain companies' names, uh, which in our integrity filter, which is more like when you shake hands with someone, 
and you when you uh, 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 when you uh, get your hand back you count how many fingers have you got and if you don't have five fingers you don't shake hands with that person ever again right so uh, that kind of assessment we have on companies by our experience looking at the corporate india landscape and some of the uh, companies that we, we wouldn't even touch with a barge pole were companies that had glowing ratings from these rating providers that is where we said that this doesn't make sense for us we need to develop our own proprietary esg assessment and that is where we kind of established a team went through a learning curve and started rating companies on esg now the very uh, given that companies are aware of the incentives that bring along with a good esg rating uh, there is a component of green washing or i wash or hog wash esg can translate into eh which we call as i wash hog wash or green wash uh they could portray something which is which they are not doing on the environmental side but portraying themselves as green or there are certain governance issues which kind of they may portray that they are following but in a sense they might not for example uh, independent directors on their board which may not be independent but friends and families on the board uh and and uh, calling them as independent so those kind of nuances we have to go through and ensure that there is enough verification involved in terms of what data company gives we do not take it at face value and kind of evaluate that try to verify that and that we do by talking to various stakeholders be it uh, company employees suppliers vendors uh, uh and and by visiting the plants and communities around it to get a first hand feedback of what the company is really doing and what it is stating is one and the same or not and that gives us good confidence and uh, to to invest our clients money into those companies so overall uh, i think esg is still very very subjective until we have standardization of data that amit uh, spoke about uh, it will still remain subjective and therefore uh, it requires a uh, uh, lens and experience and therefore uh, uh, that is what we bring to the table so uh, overall uh, i think it will continue to evolve even we have not perfected the science or maths around it uh, we our process will also continue to evolve as we get more data and and that is how we will safeguard clients capital or investors capital that we put into those companies. Mm. Mm. So very helpful, very helpful. And I want to get specifically to how we at this line of discussion about measurement because that's a big question, right? And I know also that I met you have a I think your your call it the 4P social impact assessment of companies. Can you explain a little bit what are these 4Ps and how does that impact assessment? Yeah, sure, Dwight. And look, we do a comprehensive impact assessment, but it's not at the philosophical level David spoke about, which is you know more trying to bring the idea of sustainability back to the center of human consciousness in a very uh, you know uh, as you use the word uh, you know very universal way beyond you know just corporate performance. It's about very existential basis you know for the planet and people, which is very different. But you know what we have been able to do because I was uh, instrumental in setting up the only multilateral called the Global Steering Group for Impact Investment, which came out of a G7 task force, and uh, we had uh, you know instituted a project under Professor Joyce Serafim at HBS, you know, to think through what is being called impact-weighted accounts. I had a chance to brainstorm, and we all felt that for corporates. the only comprehensive way truly comprehensive way is to think through every line of a pnl balance sheet and say how do you convert into an impact weighted thing so when we built a methodology we were not looking at just at the existing frameworks of sasb or gri or b labs but thinking more holistically how do you convert every line item in a way that you almost have a impact tree so our ratings that come out there is a corporate impact rating on a scale of 1 to 4 which a corporate may be a green silver gold platinum but across six level it goes down to 300 kpis to every bulb being lit in a factory okay so in the end your emissions affluence your people policies you know you know your hiring policies your pay disparities everything has to kind of you know get into your impact rating because you know it's not good enough to just say i'm an equal opportunity employee you got to measure how many people you know look from you know minorities are you actually recruiting are you paying women the same as you pay men etc so we you have to measure everything so we put a kpi system 
dashboards across 300 roughly KPIs and they differ by industry to get to. So which makes it, there is a little bit of forecasting ability for a company to say, hey, if I have to improve my impact rating and I'm going to spend X million dollars this year, here are the 10 areas I should invest in and my rating can overall go up and, you know, et cetera. So there is a, you know, uh, you know, almost uh, a root cause analysis embedded in our impact tree, but also a forecasting ability, you know, but I think, look, I, you know, David's thoughts were very sobering. And thanks, David, for sharing that. And, David, you know, and I just want to end with it reminded me about Adam Smith's second book, which never got so famous. So Adam Smith wrote two books. We all know the wealth of nation, but he wrote a book called Theory of Moral Sentiments, which was about human reciprocity, which he thought was a better piece, but world never remembers it. But I think this whole idea of sustainability, impact economy, about our reciprocity, not just with each other, but with nature and the interconnectedness of us with the world. That's a thought that still has to get into the impact thinking, you know, for companies and investors, because everything, air, water and, you know, the space, oxygen, you know, everything, you know, is scarce. Food is going to be scarce. And, you know, looking 20, 30 years ahead, you know, one can't help but be sobered about what lies ahead for our generations to come. So I think while these comprehensive assessments are a starting point, they are by no way the ending point, Dwight. I think we are going to see, you know, but let the world get to this level one by 2030, you know, pushed by the SDGs momentum. And then I think, you know, over the following few decades, we are going to think long and hard of, you know, how this whole economy works and think about this larger cosmic connection. Because today, you know, it is... Any Indian farmer can now have a solar pump, just dig a well and take as much water out of the, you know, earth as possible. And that is not sustainable. And I think so. But, you know, you're extremely bright. I can hear it in the way in which you can articulate all of your points. The challenge that I have is I often play timeline thinking. We don't talk a lot about timelines and dates we have to hit when we talk about sustainability. We, we put out wishes. We're all old enough. I will be 58 very soon. We, lo- we grew up, there were supposed to be flying cars. There were supposed to be this u- utopia. By the time I was, by the year 2000, I woke up this morning, morning in a bed. I had sheets on. I did that when I was a little boy. Uh, I went to the bathroom and then I went and took a shower and that was water. I didn't have ray beams. I cooked some eggs downstairs and I put it on a stove that had gas coming out. And if you look around the appliances of my home, I have a washing machine, a dryer, a refrigerator, an oven, a microwave. And most of those are as old as can be. I mean, they've got new tech in them, but they're as old as can be. So my question becomes, draw. how do you try to draw the timeline of where we are today and when do you think the convergence of all of these big challenges will actually happen? When will it get to a point where climate change is so bad, they're talking right now of about 50 to 60 degrees C in the Middle East. What happens when it's 50 to 60 degrees C in the Middle East and Northern Africa? Where do those people go? That actually goes through India. It goes through Bangladesh. It goes through Pakistan. It goes through Hong Kong. And in Texas or right now in the United States, they're having extreme temperatures too and all of these wildfires. So where is the convergence of artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, 3D printing? Where is the convergence of all of these? And ask yourself, are we solving? You're, you're all sent to be very mathematically inclined. Are we solving for X? And that's all I think about is X. I have 38 years in my mind. That's the number, 38. Upon 38, so I add my children in. I have a 27-year-old and a 28-year-old. I add my wife. I'll still be alive, most likely, because my, my family's age. What will my life be like? So are you solving for X? I, I, and that's the challenge with, I think, sustainability investing is we're, we're measuring, but we're not solving for X. We're measuring to get to X, but we don't know what X is. So what was the answer to that? No, the, the fundamental disconnect there, David, is that a fund manager thinks in terms of annual returns or a five to seven year fund life. 
the problems you're talking about will take a generation to solve, which is why I made the point, I really do not think the path to sustainability goes through investment. It's one part of it. I agree that certainly money has to be allocated uh, in an ethical way, in a sustainable way, but it's a very small part. To Amit's point, if you're going to take the view resources are getting scarce, well, governments need to start taxing them because that is the biggest discouragement, you know, for use of resource by companies because it will hurt them. So, you know, it is a multi-stakeholder effort uh, across the globe with stakeholders moving at different speeds in different economies. So, you know, it's, it's a very, very complex challenge. And that's why some people say the best form of sustainability is not to consume at all and to move towards it's a zero impossible. growth, you know, uh, type of model, you know, so which may be... Have, have, you ever heard of a, have you ever heard of a guy by the name of um, Robert Zubrin? Robert Zubrin is the head of the Mars Society. He is a huge, huge, huge fanatic of Mars. And he just did a podcast. We have one uh, podcast series called The Age of Infinite. I believe in infinite possibilities and infinite resources. Sustain, uh, abundance means scarcity. But he did a podcast just recently with us, and he said resources are unlimited. And it was fascinating because he said until we label it a resource, it's not. Land was not a resource until we had agriculture. So we, we're measuring resources that we've labeled as resources, but they might not be. But he went in an angle he's never gone before. And people have heard him talk about Mars forever. He never spoke about Mars. His whole family was killed in Nazi Germany. There's very few people left, similar to my father. He, Nazi Germany said we were running out of resources. And therefore, the reason they expanded was to have more resources. But yet, look at Germany today. The average income back then was 200 US dollars, and now it's a wealthy society. They don't have any more land. But Nazi Germany's approach to solving challenges was based upon a construct of limited resources. And we're, we're labeling them. That's what, that's what it's, it's impact investing well, is doing. Is colonialism saying, is a structure based on limited resources. Correct. <laughs> Well, this discussion, oh. let's, let's, not, let's not colonize the, the discourse. <laughs> this discussion. This I discussion. think we're over time, actually. Do we I know what this went over actually, a long time ago. discussion is getting more interesting. Uh, they, send, they send instructions to the chair. We've gone on, but they still take it. But I think we've, uh, we've pushed their graces a little too long there. No, no, I, I, don't, I, I don't think they have any challenge with this. Actually, I think the biggest challenge that I have with panels is that during the program, people are talking to the points and not talking with one another. And that's why I tried to, when I said, you said cement, I brought up cement because that didn't sound right. That, that's the way, I mean, right. it was, I'm sorry you did that. But this is the discussion that really should be recorded. Right. How do we solve for X and what is X? And I don't, I, I, I'm not marketing. I wrote a book called Paid to Think. And the challenge that I have is people start with strategy and they don't start with desired outcome. Right. And we I really think, need to start at what is the desired outcome. I think there has to be a balance between, you know, what each person is doing, how they bring to the panel, and then this huge debate. And I think we actually accomplished it very well. So I think we had no, some. No, I'm not, I'm yeah. not disagreeing. So question for you. How are you, what do you think we should do to solve this impact investing and sustainability? You, you ask questions, but let's hear your answer. Uh, some of the ideas have come up already. I'm, I'm an old line uh, community organizer from way back. So I start with the concrete situation. And so even when we do ESG uh, assessment for our center in Chicago, we start with the, the, the material that's germane to the company. And I think uh, Chirac mentioned that in his met all you have, but that, I, that, this is how we, we what's the concrete thing and then we try to draw a larger sort of you know overarching uh, meta narrative if you will to that and then come, go back to the concretes and we also do a do you have to keep on repeating concrete and then we oh God, please and then we, also <laughs> do, we do we do comparative so this would for this is part of our method for me this is part of the center's method right how do we compare like that so um this has been an awesome conversation. Yeah, go ahead. We, no, please. Yeah. Go ahead. I, 
Do I need to take everyone's leave? But I want to just end on a note of optimism. I want to remind everyone: Look, industrial revolution did make goods cheaper. You know, a guy called Jean Monnet in building European Union, you know, ended a cycle of wars. The tech movement, you know, and if you were, you know, you were born in in the in the years I was, no one would have imagined in a late eighties or early nineties will be connected the way. But tech revolution connected us in unprecedented way. I want to end on the note of hope. The impact revolution will help us create a sustainable world. We can't have all the answers, all the timelines, all at once. But men, have, it has been men who have solved these problem over the ages, and you know, and we will solve these problem. I want to just thank you all for a great uh, panel. But Dwight, I have, uh, I have to leave now, and would like to take your, uh, you know, have your permission to go. Yes, I think we should all yeah. depart. Uh, and continue the conversation okay. afterwards. So I appreciate everybody taking the time and uh, enjoy the rest of the weekend, whatever day it is in your country. All right? So be well. Sure. Thanks. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.